All right, where does the camera get me? Does it? Do I have to stay? All right, well, I'll try not to move around too much then. But I do like to move. Am I, am I good? I need tape on the floor. Man, it's loud. All right, so it's 10 o'clock, so actually 10.01. Sorry for the little technical issues that we had, but now we got that worked out. Um, thanks for getting up early on a Sunday to come in here. Uh, I know that can be tough, especially after the big parties that they have on Sunday, uh, Saturday night. Uh, so we're going to talk about recharging, penetration, testing to maximize value. Um, and so pen testing is something I've been doing for a long time. I focus on AppSec side of the house. Um, I used to do all of it, but now I really just focus on the AppSec side. So that's where we're going to kind of look. But a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about can be pulled over into the network side as well, or Wi-Fi, whatever you're testing. Uh, so just a little bit about me. My name is James Jardine. If you haven't met me before, uh, if you have, great. If not, feel free to come up. I uh, love meeting new people. Um, I'm the CEO of Jardine Software. Don't let the software confuse you. Um, I've had the company for a long time where I used to do software, uh, and now I focus on application security services for my clients, um, doing things like program reviews, penetration testing, and security education. I uh, do a lot of instructing, a lot of presenting. I uh, presented here a few years ago. Uh, and most notably more is I do a lot of blogging and podcasting. So a lot of the stuff that I talk about, I also write about, I talk about on a podcast. Um, so you can check those out. I've got them listed at the bottom there. So why do we want to talk about this? For me, and I just came up with this this morning, so bear with me. Uh, 6.30 I woke up and I was like, you know what, this is perfect. So I like to do woodworking and such on the side when I'm, when I'm not working on security stuff. Uh, and so recently, this is a bench that we had that uh, is very old. Uh, you know, it used to be a park bench in the city and then it got kind of moved over and, and they replaced them, so we got our hands on some. But it's pretty rickety, right? It's functional, we can sit on it, it works, it's good. Uh, but it's pretty run down. Uh, so we actually took some time and, and we redid it a little bit. Uh, this is the greatest picture, I get a better one. Um, but I, d I felt bad saying this is the same bench. This is the same bench. Uh, but I redid it, right? And I said, look, this is going to be something that's going to be more enticing. People are going to be interested in looking at it. They want to deal with it. Uh, they may want to sit in it. It may actually start conversations. Uh, so we redid it. Uh, original wood, new hardware, but the rails and everything are all the same, right? And it looks much better. Uh, this one, the picture is just a little bit better, but it's not the same bench. It just looked the same. But just to show, right? I mean, the functionality didn't change, but what we get out of it might actually be more because we might start more conversation about it. So that's why I thought, you know what, this is kind of an interesting lead-in to when we talk about pen testing as it is versus where I think there's some places we can make some enhancements to make pen testing better and more valuable to our clients. We know what we're doing when we pen test, but how can we get more out of the clients? So the first question we have, what is pen testing? All right, everybody, this is different. I mean, depending on who you talk to, it's actually going in and trying to get, doesn't matter whether it's network, whether it's web, whether it's Wi-Fi, right? I mean, you're trying to penetrate in as far as you can. you got specific goals. I want to get domain credentials. I want to get all this data. But you talk to other people, and a lot of times, especially when we talk about app pen testing, it's more about, really, it's a vulnerability assessment kind of on steroids, right? It's, I want to go find as much as I can about this application, find all the security risks, and then bring those over, report them, and bring them back to the client so they can get better at developing software. Right? Rarely are we seeing we're getting in there through an application like this and getting domain creds. Right? A lot of our apps sit out on different servers. They're not even on our infrastructure. So we do not get this. Right? So a lot of the testing that we see actually turns into really a vulnerability assessment with some exploitation involved. Right? We're identifying cross-site scripting and SQL injection and logic flaws and all these different things. Right? So we have to understand what are we doing with it and how does it differ from things like bug bounties? Right? I mean, how different are we from that? And there's a big difference there. We won't get into it this, but there's a big difference, right? I mean, from what we're doing. Um, you know, we do stuff on a contractual basis. We're doing things specifically for the client. It's not in its own silo, which we'll talk about. So anybody attend DerbyCon last year? I mean, this is a pretty regular event. People like coming to this, right? Uh, anybody sit the panel that they had on the future of InfoSec? Um, I wasn't here last year, but I did watch the video. As you can see, I took a screenshot of it. Uh, it was good, right, talking about where are we going with this. And they talked a lot about penetration testing, and we're getting more into the need of saying, hey, I can't just provide a simple report of, hey, you have cross-site scripting. We have to start mapping this stuff in uh, you know, what Ed Scotus referred to as adversarial mapping. 
right? Getting further into it and saying, okay, yes, you have cross-site scripting, but what does that mean? What does that mean to you in your organization? Because if it's just a generic, I have cross-site scripting, well, then what does that really mean for me as far as, well, where's that on my priority list? Right? A healthcare system may be different than a financial system, which is different than your marketing site that's out there. Right? It's all still a risk, but I have to understand, how does it really affect me? And that's our goal as pen testing, right? is we're coming in saying, I'm going to put value behind these things that we're going to identify, not just identify them. Right? We talk about, uh, Dave Kennedy mentioned how the red team learns from the blue team. You know, one thing I like to say is, even though we like to separate red and blue, red is really a part of blue. Right? We are a defensive mechanism to be able to help the defensive side. If we weren't part of blue, then we'd actually destroy things. <laughs> right? We'd actually steal the data and use it for bad. We're here to help build up the blue side and say, hey, here, we're testing your weaknesses. We're identifying them. We're going to help you get past that. Uh, you know, Quantifying how well that defense is detecting you, um, that's typically more, uh, unfortunately, on the network side. Uh, applications still do a really horrible job at doing good logging so that we don't know what's going on in them anyway. Uh, but it's still something that we're trying to detect, right? When we do an app pad test, you know, there should be somebody looking to see if we're going to do this. And now the question is, who's looking? Probably not our developers, right? I mean, they're not looking at the logs for that. They look at troubleshooting logs. They don't look at traffic logs and attack logs and those type of things. Um, understanding our failure points, right? Don Strand talked about that. Uh, and Nickerson, who, you know, near to my heart, the idea that we are a quality assurance industry, right? I mean, when we're pen testing, when we're doing any type of testing, whether it's bug bounties, pen testing, however it is, right, it's QA. I mean, it is a form of QA. We're helping them understand the quality of their application, the quality of their network against security, not just the we spelled stuff wrong or functionality doesn't work as we expect, right? So we're a value add to them. But one of the concerns I often see, uh, I don't know how many people saw this floating around Twitter, uh, not long after it came out, a bunch of people were t hashtagging pen testers on it, uh, you know, as if this is how we're perceived, right? We come in, we break stuff, and we leave. Sorry about your bad luck, I'm not cleaning this up, right? And that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, if this is really how we're perceived, then why would people want to work with us, right? I don't want somebody to just come in and break a whole bunch of my stuff and leave, I want somebody that's going to be a partner in what I'm doing. I want somebody to help me out. So I thought that was interesting. It actually got me all riled up. Um, if you hear me talk offline, I'll, I'll rant about this stuff all day long. Uh, but working on changing that perception, right? We don't want to be that. We want to be more than just a tester. We want to be more than just a red team of coming in and saying, hey, I'll find some vulnerabilities and I'll send them your way. We want to be more than a breaker, right? We always say, well, we're breakers. We're not fixers. I'm not saying we have to be fixers. Right? That is a specialized skill, and quite honestly, most of us probably do not have that skill. We're good at breaking, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? We have to embrace that. But we're here to be the experts. Right? If I'm hiring a pen test company to come in and test my apps, I'm assuming you are a network expert. You are an application security expert. Right? You know how this stuff works. Uh, and much deeper than just being able to break it. Right? And when we look on the network side, we often know this stuff. How many people that do network testing really understand networks and they understand server admin and, you know, you can go into a Linux box and walk your way around a command line and do all this stuff, but then you start getting out and start doing web app testing or mobile app testing and it's like, yeah, I can run a proxy and I can run some of these tools, but maybe I don't know exactly how development works. I write some scripts that's not really development. Um, you know, I put together some tools, but enterprise development is very different. So we often don't understand that. Um, so it's, it's kind of a detriment to us. But we're here to help, right? If we understand that I'm not here to be in a silo, right? I always like to say breaking down the silos. Uh, we're here to help. We're here to test for a reason. It's not just adversarial testing that we're doing. We actually want to be providing value back to the client. And unfortunately, to do that, we actually have to hack that whole process and use social engineering <laughs> to get them to understand what we're saying matters. Uh, everything that we put out there doesn't mean it's going to be something on the top of everybody's list. And I, I saw somebody not too long ago, they were ranting on Twitter about, uh, you know, username harvesting flaw and how it wasn't part of a lot of bug bounties. You know, and, and as we talked about it through the Twitter 140 character limit, which is ridiculous, by the way, to, to have a conversation. As we talked about that, I started asking the question, like, well, why does it matter? 
I mean, you're talking username harvesting. What are you trying to do with it? Because everything you're trying to do, you've got a million usernames in your list that you've downloaded from some breach, and you want to go and attack the site with that. Okay, well, what's username harvesting going to get you? It's going to help reduce your list, right? Great. It'll be less queries going against, but quite honestly, nobody's logging. So if I send a million requests or I send 100,000 requests, if they're not logging, it doesn't matter. If they are logging, I send 100,000 requests, they're probably going to see it anyway. So it didn't help me. Right? So yes, it's a flaw, but we have to understand what does that flaw mean and is it important to the company? Because I can do all that stuff with username harvesting. I can do it without it. You know, until you want to get down into really specific, hey, I want to spearfish people and I know you're a user of this system. So now I can send out just to users and cut down my traffic. But as far as attacking a site directly, right, that's not a necessary means. We can get around that. So I always like to say application and network, right? They're different. Um, anybody that thinks otherwise, I'm willing to say you're wrong. <laughs> They're different, right? Like I said before, I mean, application people, they know applications, they know development. It's a different set of vulnerabilities that we're looking at versus when we're looking at a network, right? We use different tools. We use different knowledge. Look at the tools, right? When I'm doing a network assessment, we're looking at things like Kali, and we're using Metasploit, and, right, Nessus, and Nmap, and we've got this whole list of tools that we can use to attack a network, right? We've got Responder out there, and we've got these different techniques that we use that if we get on your network, this is what we're going to attack with. And this is just a short list. Don't feel like I gypped anybody. Uh, but then we look on the application side, right? We use different tools. Uh, rarely am I using Metasploit on an application test except for if I actually find a vulnerability through some other means and then I'm going to try to exploit it, right? Like I'm actually going to put a remote shell on a machine. But I'm not using Metasploit to find vulnerabilities in a web app. Anybody do that? It doesn't work very well, as far as I know, uh, right? Typically we're using Burp, we're using a proxy of some sort to find those, and then as we find them, we switch into the tools. I use my SQL map, I use these other things to get around, but I'm not relying on the same types of tools. You know, you might even run Nessus, but it's not going to give you a whole lot with your web app. It's more infrastructure related. Um, so we have to understand that these tools are different that we're using out there. The knowledge that we're using is different, right? So network side, it's very heavy on the networking knowledge your server admin type knowledge, understanding OSs and all the stuff that's going on and your DHCP and your DNS and all that stuff. While you go into an AppSec interview and they'll ask you those questions, they're not nearly as relevant, right? Because when I'm attacking an application, a true application credentialed, much do I need to know about DNS? Not a whole lot. I don't need to know about DHCP. I don't need to know about a lot of the packet traffic going back and forth because I attack it differently. Right, so there's a different knowledge there. In application, I say, look, we have to understand development. We have to understand how applications are built the same way we need to understand how networks are built. And of course, networking and servers, that all comes into play with an application security deal because, well, once we actually pop the box, we find a way in. Now we have to know all this stuff. Right, but it's a very different context because how often are you getting that far with applications? And then once you do, right now you have to have that. So I always say we need to have a solid understanding of development. Right? Just like I've said before, we have to have a good solid understanding of networking. When I go in and test networks, I have to have an understanding of networking. I have to understand the protocols. I have to understand all that stuff. If you're going to go test Wi-Fi, right, you have to understand those tools. You have to understand that. Same thing with development. We have to understand how these apps are built. There's so much change going on in development. Right now we've got Angular, like so much client-side stuff now that's going on, so not even half of it is server-side anymore. Now you're attacking things like Angular and React. Uh, now they've got Electron out, which we can actually make like desktop apps that are all built with JavaScript <laughs> and call out to APIs. You know, um, if you use Slack, anybody use Slack? That's written in Electron. Um, so it's a JavaScript application, right? JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. All put on there, we can put a cross-platform. It's loading items from outside down in, right? This is potential security concern. Right, but if we don't understand how this stuff works, we can't help go in and attack it, right? So we have to do that. So I, the way I say going about this is, you know, build more stuff. 
you know, if you're actually interested in application development, just like if you're interested in network, you know, you're going to go out and you're going to build networks, right? You're going to set them up, you're going to build cool domains, and you're going to do all this stuff. Go out and build some apps. You know, understand what developers go through as they're building applications because it'll help you out a lot. I just recently did a presentation uh, back in Jacksonville. It's called Code on the Beach. Uh, I did a presentation for developers. I mean, it's a developer conference. And talking to them about, look, this is how I look at applications. Because we always say, right, developers look at applications differently than we look at applications. So I go in and say, this is how I look at applications. And of the applications I've looked at over the years, here's the things that I see this, you see that. Right, so you come in and you see a nice little e-commerce site where I can add items to my cart. Right, I see the ability to put negative values in there and take money from you and put it in my account. Right, or I see ways to, on your simple contact us form, because you decided to put the to address in the form in a hidden field, I see a way where I can use this as a spam mailing system, but you're seeing it as this. And when we start talking to them about that, they start to understand it. You know, we, we do a lot of talking about developers don't know what they're doing with security and these apps are crap and all that. But if you really look at it, the apps aren't junk, right? They're not just falling apart. They're working. They're getting what they expected to have it done. Are they missing a security side? Yes, right? And so that's what we're here to help with, is help get that across to everybody, that there is a security piece to what we're trying to do. How can we help do that? And so as we start to understand it, and I think we understand it more on the network side, right? Because a lot of us come from a network background, so you under, that's just part of what you did. So you already understand network. You didn't have to try to understand network concepts and all that. But going in and understanding how apps are built within an enterprise and going through, you know, whether doing continuous integration, you know, how it goes through QA. I mean, there's this whole process. Now we got DevOps, we got DevSecOps or SecDevOps or I don't know what they're calling it these days. I don't know why DevOps didn't have security in it in the beginning, because uh, it's fairly new. But we've got all these things, but we don't understand the processes. So when we say, oh, you've got cross-site scripting, I don't know why that's not fixed today. But you don't know their process for getting that from development up into production. Uh, and in some companies, it can be a nightmare, right? I mean, it can be an extra, a really long process to try to push a patch into production. So that's why it's not happening so quickly. But we start to understand that. We start to understand how the tools work that they develop with, right? If we know that we're attacking people that it's a .NET application, so they use Visual Studio as their IDE, you know, we can start making assumptions about, hey, how do they work, right? What are they doing? What does their IDE provide them? What does their language provide them? Um, I come from a .NET background. I've been doing .NET since the beta release in 2001. So when I look at an ASPX app, I mean, anything that's ASP.NET, when we talk about web forms, we talk about MVC, right? I understand what they're doing to build that. I understand what it builds out of the box. I understand what they have to do on top of it. And so when I go attack an application, I know where I want to look because the typical fit pitfalls of where they're going to miss that. Just like most common network people, when they come in, they know the pitfall. They know you cut corners over here because as a network guy, I cut corners over there. You know, and so as you start to understand this, you start to be quicker and more efficient at doing that, um, attending developer-specific conferences. Uh, anybody see any developers walking around here? One, or I mean, see a couple. I mean, it's not common, right? They probably don't want to put their name out there because they'll probably get beat up in the parking lot. Like, uh, hey, I'm a developer. Uh, you don't see a lot, and vice versa. You go to developer conferences, you don't see a lot of security people there. So, you know, the more we can get out. Now we're starting to see more. Uh, like Java One and, and some of those, you know, big conferences, you start some, some people start actually getting pushing out, right? But you're not seeing a lot of security people going out to the OWASP AppSec or App conferences, right? I mean, you see some, but it's, it's not like we normally see. So if we start getting out and attending some of those and start talking with people and saying, hey, I'm not here to say your baby's ugly and good luck, right? It's, no, we're here to work with you. I don't know everything, right? And it's okay for us to say that. But at the same time, we want to let them know we're here to help, not to be an adversary. Uh, going to local meetups, I actually just started recently doing this, of going to, like, you know, go to meetup.com or whatever and, and find local groups to go out and talk to, um, or like the, the local dev conference I went to. Uh, it made a difference, you know, going in and talking to people about security, because as you talk to developers about security, 
you'll actually find they're interested to know about it. They want to know. They want to write secure apps because they want to write the best app. Just like we take pride in our work, they take pride in theirs. So they want to do this. But again, we separate ourselves. So we're over here talking. They're over here talking. I, I gave the concept a few years ago. Uh, you know, the, it's like a high school dance. You know, nobody wants to cross into the middle and actually start talking to each other. And we find that once we start doing that, well, then we can get it across. But we have to do it in a positive way. You know, doing things like webinars, um, getting out there, watching some dev webinars. You know, what are they keeping up with what they're doing? I'd never even heard of Electron until I went to that conference. And I watched through it, and I was like, man, this is cool. And the first thing I thought of was, I mean, there's got to be some cool ways to hack this. There's got to be something going on, right? Like, what are the security deal with Electron around it? And lo and behold, if you actually go out to the Electron website, you can just do a search for uh, Google search for Electron. You go out to the website, they actually have a link for security. And they've got a small little list that says, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> if you do this, you're on your own, right? We're actually starting to see them put some stuff out there. The question is, how do we get more of that? Uh, Ruby does it. Uh, if you go out and look at Ruby on Rails, they have a guide out there that talks about security for their systems. But we're still not doing a very good job of getting that information out there for devs to actually see it. But even so, it's still just important for us. Right? How many people that have tested Ruby apps from an AppSec? Anybody do AppSec in here? I mean, hopefully some people do. <laughs> you go out and test this, right? I mean, I, I come from a, a company that we tested everything. Right? It didn't matter what it was. Somebody wanted a pen test, you test it. Uh, but you're going to go out and test a Ruby site. Do you go out and look at these guys? Is that part of your information gathering to say, hey, let me go see what's common about Ruby? Or do you just go in there, fire up your burp, proxy, and you just start hammering away at the side. And you're like, oh, yeah, I found this, found that. It's common stuff, and out to go. It actually makes a difference if we start understanding what languages they're using, what frameworks they're using. And as we start building into that, now we get insight. We can actually give them a better result because now I'm saying, I understand what you're doing. That'd be like me going out there and saying, look, I'll test a Linux box and a Windows box, but I only know one of them, and I'm not going to look up the other. So I'll just run my same scans, and I'll run the same stuff, and we'll get the same results. And I missed a whole bunch of stuff because Linux works differently than Windows. right? I mean, that's what we're looking at here. So as we start to understand what development's doing, we start to get better at how we're testing. And not only better, we get faster. right? You can build up these templates, but you get much more efficient. I mean, the stuff I can find very quickly going through an application compared to people that aren't as good at development or understanding the background of it. I mean, it's crazy the difference you can see sometimes. Uh, it was interesting. I was at a company watching another guy do a network pen test. Guy was amazing. I mean, this guy had command line. He knew what he was running. And I'll tell you, if I'm doing a network pen test, because I focus mostly on app, uh, you know, I'm looking up commands. <laughs> what do I do with this? Yeah, okay. You know, we can get through it. We fumble through it. I mean, this guy, he's pounding out commands like it's nobody's business. And, you know, I'm like, that's awesome. That's exactly how I feel when I do web stuff. You know, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm not doing as much searching, right, because that's my knowledge base. But then you go look, and that same person that goes and does a web test, and you look at the results, and you're like, obviously this guy's a network guy, because he missed a lot of stuff on that web pen stuff, right? And so as we start to learn more about it, we get better at identifying these things. The other thing we need to look at is scoping. You know, we talk about scope all the time. I know, red team and penetration testers, you know, we want to say we're just like the attacker. We don't want any rules. We want to be able to do whatever we can. I want to be able to test whenever I can. I want to be able to do DOS. I want to be able to do anything I can to get into the site. But as we know, this is not the reality, right? We don't get to do that. Uh, I've got an engagement coming up. They told me you have to test at night. Whatever, I'll test it. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't really matter to me. It opens up my day. Uh, but it doesn't matter. I told them, look, my testing, you're not going to see a lot. I don't run a lot of automated scanning. So I'm not going to bring you site down. My very manual testing. But I'm not going to argue about it. You want it at night? Perfect. We'll do it at night. All right, but understanding more than that, understanding what's in scope, what applications are you testing? What applications do they have? Uh, how many times have you gone in? Everybody's got mobile apps now that, you know, relate to their web apps. But are you testing them both at the same time? I find most places they'll do a mobile application pen test, and then they'll do a web application pen test. And they might do an API pen test. right? But they do them at different times. But I've seen it. I used to work. I mean, like I'm willing to admit the failures I had as a developer, and there were plenty, especially when it comes to security. 
uh, <laughs> I wrote some very insecure apps. I, we didn't know that at the time, just as a disclaimer, I didn't know that. But they were insecure. I actually wrote an app, it's probably still live today, where the price in the cart is a hidden field. Uh, and you can change it if you'd like um, and get the item for that price. So just as, I don't run that site still, so I don't have any obligation to fix it. Don't look at me like that. All right, but it's out there. Uh, but I worked at another company where we had web forms, wind forms, mobile device. Right, We had a whole bunch of stuff around it. And what we found was the web guy did a great job of input validation. You couldn't get cross-site scripting past him for nothing, right? I mean, he locked it down. It was perfect. He didn't do output encoding. We learned that real quick. Because the mobile guys did not care about what they took in. They didn't care about cross-site scripting input because it wasn't a problem for them. You know, this is back on the WinCE days. So there was no web browsing through it. It was a WinCE form. You couldn't cross-site script that. So it was nothing to put malicious code into the mobile app and cause cross-site scripting in the web app. But how many times, like I said, do we actually go test and we're like, oh yeah, we'll do a mobile test this week and we'll do the web test this week. Well, if we had done those at different times, I'm not going to see that. I'm not going to see the correlation because I'm not going back into the website to test it. Or I'm not doing something in the website to see if the mobile site hits it. Or I'm not testing the API that everything's hitting to see how it works. Right? And so this becomes a concern so we have to try to push, and this is an education part on our side, that when we go out to clients and they say, hey, we want an app pen test. Okay, but tell us the components of your app. What do you actually have? Because we want to test this all at once. I don't want to do them separate. And here's the reasons why. And a lot of times they don't know. I mean, they just don't think about it that way. So as we start thinking about that, then we start to understand, oh yeah, we should really test these at the same And I'll fight with people. You need to test these at the same time. You're really losing out on value if we don't test these at the same time. What is our timeline for testing, which is something we'll talk about, and then being descriptive um, in that, because we really want to think about how long do we test for? That's a concern. Oftentimes we test for like a week, a couple days maybe. Um, and then our reports oftentimes are not descriptive. And both of those we'll talk a little bit more about. Something I often get asked, should we have source code in our pen test? Um, you see a lot of people out there now talking about source code assisted pen testing. Anybody seen that? Um, seen some people talking about it on Twitter. I know there's a few companies that really push for it. Um, as a matter of fact, they'll go far enough that if they find stuff, they'll actually create patches and give them to you. Uh, I don't know about that. That seems a little, <laughs> seems a little over the top, seems a little risky. Uh, but should you have it? To me, that's a question that's kind of difficult to answer because I don't think a lot of people can actually look at the source code and understand it enough to be able to make it useful, right? And so we want to make sure that our tests are useful. So if you're doing app testing, if you're not a developer, you're just an app tester, looking at source code is going to help. Right? Maybe it'll pick up some simple stuff, but it can also be a sink of your time. Because you're like, oh man, I'm really not finding anything on the web. Let me go in and look at the source and see if I can find something. And you're trying to script through and find stuff, and maybe you don't understand how the frameworks work, uh, if you can even get your hands on the source code. A lot of places won't share it. But it could take you away, right? We always talk about the methodology for pen testing and, you know, that kind of five minute, five try rule, because I don't want to get caught over here, and then miss testing the whole site. Same thing if you actually have source code brought into it, is what am I going to miss? Because inevitably, if I got source code, hopefully you're thinking, man, let me go look at the login and see how they're storing their passwords, because I can't tell from outside. You know, let me go see how they're doing this and see if there's easy ways to bypass it. And you end up finding out that you didn't spend enough time actually testing the application. You did this kind of half-sided code review. Uh, you know, it's always interesting to me. I wrote out to some recruiters because you always see, hey, we need AppSec people. And well, I want an AppSec person that can do pen testing and secure code review and, you know, all these things. And I'm like, those are kind of two different things. And while a lot of us are really good at pen testing, secure code review is hard. Right? It's not easy. Um, I did secure code review for a company for a year where it's all we did. And there's a lot you have to know. Um, even today, still, um, I'll do code review, but only for .NET because I know .NET. I don't know Java. I can write a little stuff in Java, but I don't know all the ins and outs. I know the ins and outs of .NET, that if I change this configuration file, it'll affect this over here this way, right? And so we talk about it. I look at those, and I'm like, so what you're really saying is you want somebody to run a static analysis tool and, and give us a report. Uh, but they don't want to come out and actually say that. But we got to be cautious. Yes? 
I'm sorry? Have you ever looked at .NET Stig? Yeah. Uh, no, I have not. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to do the source code stuff, just make sure that you're aware there's some pitfalls around that. You don't want to get caught into them. Increased timeline. Um, this is something I talk about a lot. Um, you know, I got kind of fed up with the whole week testing time frame. You know, I'm trying to slam through. I've only got a week to do stuff. Um, you know, I miss out on so much. Think about how much you learn in 30 days or think about how much you learn in 60 days. Uh, so a lot of what I do now is I push for people and say, hey, look, you know what? Let's not do a week test. Let's do a 30-day test. And I'm not saying I'm testing for eight hours a day for 30 days. What I'm saying is we're going to test over 30 days. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in what we're doing. It helps build our collaboration about what we're doing, right? And it helps improve that knowledge transfer. I've got one client that when we test, we'll do a 30-day test. Every week we get on a two-hour call, a webinar or a go-to meeting or whatever, right? And we'll actually sit there and go through, hey, here's what we're currently seeing. They actually help test a little bit too. Um, they work with me on it. But we go through, what are we seeing? And we actually had where he had identified something because we actually weren't testing mobile, <laughs> but he was on the side. But he found the mobile piece had a code in it that was important to us. And so he's like, hey, check this out. And so we look at it. And we're, you know, we're going back and forth. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I can do this with this code, but I'm not really sure where to go. And I was like, great. I said, how about we try this? And we start working through it. And probably 30 minutes in, we were able to go from a self-registered user to a full admin user on that web account based on the information you found, right? And it was through us walking through, and it was great because, you know, we're looking at a lot of stuff. He found something. We get to go through it, but he's also learning as well, right? He's seeing different ways we look at it because he wouldn't have put together over here to over there, right? And so as we look through it, we talk about it, right? We work through it together. Uh, so the collaboration is great, and there's lots of ways we could do it, right? I mean, one, it allows us to do more, but we can use things like Slack. Anybody use Slack? Seems like it's becoming pretty popular. Uh, now, depending on your fear of security levels and all that stuff, you know, how much you want to put through Slack or something, uh, that's up to you and your client. But you can use Slack to stay in touch um, using something like Skype um, or other Microsoft technologies. Uh, I put Microsoft on there for things like OneDrive. Um, you know, I share a lot of documents through Office 365. Hey, look, here's the report as we're building it. You can go in and see. You can see what we're doing. You can have, if there's things you have concerns about, we can address them right away. Um, you know, but it allows us to be interactive using things like GoToMeeting or uh, WebEx, some of those things where we can get on together and talk about things. Um, these things really help kind of build that bond that I'm not just here to test for you. I'm here to work with you and help you get through this. Transparency. You know, getting more out there. Uh, one of the things I was always frustrated with when I was on the receiving end of reports, I don't know really what you're doing. Yes, I see what you found, and I see some screenshots that use Burp to do it, or if it's a network test. I see screenshots that use this tool, but you're not really giving me a whole lot of detail about what are you really doing to get this stuff. So helping them understand more of, hey, I use this, and this is the reason why I use this tool. Right? Share ideas that failed. Hey, you know what? I tried this. It didn't work. It's okay to not get something to work, but let them know the stuff you're trying because the more that we tell them about how we test, the more they start to understand how they can look at their apps internally or how they can share that with the developers or how our thought process works that they can then share that out with their developers and people start understanding, hey, this is how they're looking at your app. These are the things they're trying. And hey, great job. You didn't fall for this one, but you fell for this one. Right? And then understanding why is it that you fell for one and not the other? Is it because your framework detects against that automatically? Right? A lot of these view engines now do a great job with cross-site scripting. A lot of them, you know, they have a lot of stuff that's great for protecting its SQL injection. But that doesn't mean the developers did that on purpose. That was just luck of the draw. Right? But let them know it was luck. You know, hey, look, this, this is what was saving you here. Keep in mind that that's what's working. You know, understanding your frameworks to do that. All right? And creating these learning opportunities, right? Why did you use that tool? I mean, this is, again, it's a relationship you're forming. It shouldn't just be a black box test that we bring in through here. I mentioned the flexibility. How many times have you had when you go out and test a site and they're like, all right, we're going to start on Monday and then you don't start till Wednesday. 
because they didn't have credentials or the site wasn't up or there was some problem or there was a family emergency or what, whatever it may be. But what happens when you don't start till Wednesday? You still finish on Friday. Right? <laughs> I've got other clients lined up. I'm not waiting. I don't get to move you over. So you just now got yourself a three-day test. Right? And that's not good for anybody. Well, I guess it's good for our pocket, right? But it's really not good for anybody. So extending that out and saying, hey, look, you know what? Let's put more time behind this. Let's build this up. Let's have some flexibility that if something happens, I lock out my credentials. Um, I typically don't do account lockout type stuff until the end, but not everybody works the same. Lock out your credentials. How long does that take for them to get that? You know, I don't even care. You know, if it's going to take you a couple hours to unlock my, that's fine. We got 30 days. We got 60, whatever. We got time. You don't have your diagrams ready on the first day. No worries. I've got questions about how the site's working because I found something and maybe I want a piece of source code. You know, because I do that. I'll ask, say, hey, can you send me the source code for this? Because this seems to be acting weird. If it takes you two days to get it to me, no worries. No worries. Right? I'm not eating in and saying, you have to stop every time I say something. Stop what you're doing and go. Right? This is to help us all out. Any type of emergency changes they're pushing, waiting on those documents, right? they all create kind of a hole that you can't get out of. Uh, improving our knowledge transfer. This is something where uh, we start doing some videos. Um, and I know some other companies that do videos as well, that when you find a good exploit, you video it. So that example I talked about where we went from the mobile app to full admin on the web, uh, we did a video for that. And it was a four minute video. Uh, and we also did a story, I wrote up a story. I was like, look, I'll write up a story, I'll write up a, you know, we'll do, I'll record a video, and we'll make sure that people understand the true cause behind this. Uh, and what it does is it shows that impact. Right? When I did the video that showed grabbing that value and going to full admin, self-registering account, all within four minutes in a video real time, that made a huge impact from what they looked at that versus me writing it up as a story, which I did. I didn't get any grace for that, right? Like, ah, whatever, it's a great story. I'm not going to read all that anyway. But they watched the video. And they watched it a lot, right? And they understood it. And they said, I, now I see it really only takes this much effort to go from here to here. We're going to fix this ASAP, right? It gives that real-time feel to it. Because otherwise, I can read the story and it's like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, you grabbed that, you did this. But it probably took you hours to do that piece, and then you had to go do this. I was like, no, it's really these five steps. And they happen like that. Right? So getting people to understand that that's how really it works, uh, we can get through this pretty quickly. Um, online meetings, like I said, I like to use them um, just to check in, go over what we're seeing, because um, it helps me learn about the application more too. How many people, when they do an app test, uh, or any type of test like that, right? sit down and actually do a walk through of the application with the company so they can tell you this is how it works, right? We say, I know applications. I'll have to get in and test. If I have questions, I'll let you know. Right? So if you can do some of these meetings, you can build that up a little bit more. I actually find that um, as I do these meetings throughout tests, my report becomes more of a deliverable than it does the, the really the gold of the whole thing. Right? My report is more of a I documented what we've already talked about. You already know about it. There's chances you could have fixed it already if you wanted to uh, before we even finish testing. Because, uh, again, I like the 30-day test uh, myself. But um, there are other companies that are pushing for longer testing periods. Right? You can still do multiple tests. How, how many people double book anyway, right? So this way I don't feel so bad about it. Uh, I actually don't like to double book. But with the 30-day, because it is a spread out thing, um, we'll actually do three at a time if we have to. Uh, getting our reporting. This is kind of where that whole bench thing came up, right? Our reporting works. It gets it out there. But how many times are you sick of going in, you test a network, you test an application this year, and you know next year when you go back it's going to be the same findings, same stuff, right? Nothing really happened with it. Um, because what do we do? We go out and we put some findings in there. We put an executive summary. Here's what we found. It's a great report. It might make it to the dev team. It might make it to the sysadmin team. It might make it in a different form. We don't know. Right, but I mean, I get frustrated when I go back and see the same vulnerabilities. If they're high, low vulnerability, whatever, they're low. I don't care. But the high ones make a difference. So, getting better reporting out of it. And I know nobody likes the reporting phase. It's not the sexy part of pen testing. But this is where we give a lot of information over. Uh, so, enhancing our methodology and talk about okay, instances versus findings. Something that I find a lot of people don't understand. Right? How many times? Doesn't matter what it is. 
right? I mean, even network, like I said, a lot of this stuff transposes back and forth. I give you a report and I say, you've got cross-site scripting, right? That's a finding, you have cross-site scripting. Well, then I break it down and I give you a few instances. Here's some examples of cross-site scripting in your site. And so what do they do? They get the report, they go back, they fix the instances, but they didn't really understand why they had cross-site scripting. Right, they went in and fixed those ones that you pointed out, and then what do we do? We come back and say, oh yeah, you fixed them. Cross-site scripting's gone. Nah, I'll find more next year. Right, because we didn't actually identify the root cause. But if we start helping them identify this, and say, inst instead of just saying, hey, this is rampant across the whole site, hey, you've got cross-site scripting, and you know, I'm noticing a, a common thing, right? You're using labels in your application, and you're not encoding those out. Go out and look for those things. Right, and then updating our findings uh, and getting those squared away. Something I always hear, they can't reproduce the flaws, right? That's a common concern. <laughs> and it's frustrating. I have clients that tell me the reason they're going with me is because they're the last company, they can't reproduce the flaws. Um, so with re reproducibility, I say, you know, make it consumable steps. Make it detailed. Don't assume they know what you're doing. Um, it, it's very difficult. It's like me talking to my wife. She has no idea what the heck I'm talking about. It makes perfect sense to me. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work well. Uh, as far as the details, right, instead of being generic and we're like, hey, here's cross-site scripting and you could steal cookies and you could do this and here's a general abstract about cross-site scripting. That's great and all, but what if we actually start getting into it and we say, hey, look, I'm going to talk about the details, right? I've got cross-site scripting and your session cookie doesn't have HTTP only enabled. And so now my narrative for cross-site scripting is, I can steal your session ID and send it off to my server and log in as your user. Right? It kind of goes back to that adversarial mapping piece where we're saying, look, it's not just that you have cross-site scripting and I throw you an alert box to show it works. It's here's a proof of concept that says I can steal your session cookie and this is why it really matters. This is why you're fixing this. Not just because I can run cross Because to be honest with you, if you tell somebody they have cross-site scripting, they don't care. It's, it's a flaw. But if I can show you this is how I would use cross-site scripting, now it starts to make sense. The other thing I like to talk about is conversation starters. So instead of just doing our general recommendations, and this is kind of an addition to recommendations, this is a way for us to say, you know what, security is rarely involved during the design phase of our application. We always say we want to do it. We hire AppSec people so they can get into the SDLC even though they live in security. We never do it. But here's our chance to say, hey, here's how we can get back involved with it. Here's how we can get the design discussion going and look back and maybe do threat modeling, whatever you want to call it that you're doing, to do this. But it allows us to circle back around. So I had this example. This was one of my clients uh, that they had username harvesting and they had a status code that was coming back. Now, the error message was the same. There was no issue with the error message. But they had the status code coming back and that was a problem. So I could easily say, hey, we've got username harvesting here. So typically what we'll do is we'll say, hey, don't return, you know, return a generic error message. That's simple. And even in this case, we could say, get rid of the status message. But is that really a good recommendation? You don't even know how that application works. I don't know what the status message is for. They probably don't know what it's for. Right? But I can't just say, don't do this. That's a poor way to do it. And these end up, they turn into like more coaching sessions, which is, it's kind of fun actually. But what if you actually go in there and say, hey, I recommend that you review the design of your login functionality and talk with the developers of what are you trying to do here? What's the status code for? How do you use that status code? Do you need the status code? If you don't need the status code, can we get rid of it? If you do need the status code, what are the other mitigations we can look at to help us reduce the username harvesting flaw we have? But we're coming at it as a positive, hey, I want to work with you. We found that there's a flaw. Let's talk about it. But, but let's not just talk about the flaw. Let's look at the login, right? You find an issue with forgot password. Let's look at your forgot password. Let's talk about what you're doing here and say, here's how we look at this, right? Now you're doing your attack trees and your threat models with them. And now as a pen tester, if you're external, you're not actually doing it, right? But you're pushing the idea and the notion of doing it into the reports and saying, hey, this is what you guys should be doing. And then now that's getting spread out through management of there. Whoever sees that report, now it's in their face. Hey, I should be thinking about this. Let's not just look at it's a cross-site scripting instance and go putting coding out there. 
let's think about why do we have cross-site scripting? Why do we have username harvesting? Let's talk about these features. And let's see if there's any other things that maybe didn't come up in the report. I mean, there might be other login issues that they have. They didn't, we didn't find. But when you go and actually say, hey, let's start talking about your thing, right? You're coming at them saying, I'm here to help. I'm not here just to tell you, hey, you got flaws in your app and I'll see you later. Let me know when you figure those out. That, that's not going to work as we go forward. So, you know, really kind of wrap things up. Uh, you know, it's more than testing. We got to be more than testing. I mean, if we actually want to make change in security, we actually have to think about how can we do that? We have to actually make it happen. We talk about we want better secure apps. We want better secure networks. We, Stop doing default passwords and hard-coded passwords and all these different things. We want this change. But what I'm seeing is our reports that we're currently doing, and the way we're going about it, doesn't do it. I see the same thing amongst how we say developers need training. You know, oh man, developers, they, they need more training. But the people that are doing the training are us. The red teamers that don't know anything about development, but we know about attacking. And we keep teaching them, this is how you attack. And then generically, well, this is how you could hypothetically protect against them. But that's not working, right? So if we want to actually get change out there, how can we do it? We can start by looking at how we do our pen test engagements and say, look, we're here to help. We're here to fight through this. We want to get you moving. And these are some ways that I think we can take to do this. Uh, and as I said, it's worked really well uh, with the clients that I've had. Um, they really like the concepts that we're putting here of getting more involved uh, if you're concerned about the idea that, well, pen testing should be kind of a, nobody knows about it, right? I mean, network, it makes more sense. I don't want the SOC to know because I want to see if they pick this stuff up. But at the same time, we do kind of want them to work with us because, hey, I just sent this stuff. Did you see it? You know, it, there's a fine line there. But keep in mind, when we talk about application security, the developers aren't watching that stuff. So it's okay to involve development and say, hey, look, we want to involve with this. We want to make you aware. They want to learn. They want to do it. They like figuring stuff out just like we do. Uh, so if we can identify who are the right people to get involved, we can actually maybe start getting more understanding out there. And hopefully we'll start getting more security and we won't start seeing the same low-hanging nonsense stuff that we're seeing every day. So that's it for my talk. Uh, so the question is, you know, have I done stuff with fusion teams where I got dedicated people from certain areas? I haven't done a lot with that, but that's what I'm trying to get. Um, the goal here is, is to identify the right resources that are going to make a difference as we do the testing. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, you know, do, for app reviews, do I test authenticated or unauthenticated? I test authenticated. Um, I know there's a question about that, right? You know, well, you know, if you're a true attacker, quite honestly, a lot of true attackers have accounts. Uh, most of these accounts are open, but you're missing out on so much if you don't have accounts. Um, if I'm unauthenticated, most likely I'm going to spend the time trying to just hack your login screen, and that's a waste of money. Most of the flaws that we see are not the login. Right, the flaws that we're seeing are these logic flaws where I can go in and manipulate hidden fields or, you know, you're missing authorization that I'm a regular user and I can access admin features, that type of stuff. And without authenticated testing, you're not going to get that type of testing. You know, so I, I like authenticated, I won't do unauthenticated testing. Because it, it just seems like a way. Yeah. Uh, so I don't fix. Um, I keep that separate because I don't want it to be a conflict. Um, so the question, you know, did I, do I ever have anybody that asked me to fix the flaws that I find? Um, I try to stay out of that space. I will certainly, uh, yeah, I mean, people will ask. Um, you know, you're seeing some companies that will start doing it. Uh, but a lot of people, they want to stay separate, right? I am on this side because if I start sitting there saying, hey, look, I'll charge you to help fix these, well, then I'm going to cite a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, right. You know, I mean, the, 
it, it's a sticky situation to get into, but I've got no problem working with them and saying, this is what will work. I had a cross-site scripting flaw that came through that was not normal. It was through Angular, through template injection, um, you know, where you use in square brackets instead of your typical less than, greater than. Um, and I actually did a write-up saying, this is exactly what the problem is. You need to remove these brackets. Right? I mean, it was very clear what they should do, but I'm not getting into your code. Like, that's a whole different insurance issue <laughs> that I don't want to be a part of. But I have no problem. You know, I, I mean, I will share my opinions. I'm not afraid to say something in the fact that, well, you said I should do this. Yeah, I, I mean, I said you should do it. But I'm not responsible if it didn't work. <laughs> so, anything else? No? Perfect. Well, I thank everybody for coming early in the morning. So I know it's, at least it's later than usual. 10 o'clock's not too bad. Right?